presentation. Thank you, Susan. Um, can everyone hear me okay? We're going to start with a, uh, a brief overview uh, regarding the pathologies included in low-grade gliomas um, and, uh, and then go on to talk about the natural history of this disease, some imaging modalities uh, that are currently used for diagnosis, and, uh, and then uh, a brief discussion about molecular genetics that could uh, aid in terms of prognosis and uh, treatment decisions. So as far as the uh, pathologies included in low-grade gliomas, the uh, three main types um, include astrocytomas, oligodendrogliomas, and a combination of uh, astrocytic and oligodendral uh, gliomas, uh, a, a, a mixed uh, glioma um, uh, with the features of both. Um, among the astrocytomas, there, there's really um, two broad categories. One is the more common uh, diffuse astrocytoma, the, the entity that we, we uh, know as a grade two uh, low-grade astrocytoma. And then there's a group that are uh, better uh, circumscribed, um, and those uh, constitute tumors such as the pilocytic astrocytoma, the segas, and the uh, pleomorphic xanthoastrocytomas. Next. Um, and then there are the la less common tumors, such as those with uh, ependymal differentiation, the ependymomas, subependymomas, um, and then the others, such as gangliogliomas and, uh, and D-nets and neurocytomas. Next. So um, in order to, to best determine what treatment modality is, uh, is beneficial for patients, I think a, a good understanding of the natural history of the disease is warranted. Um, as you can see from the table, pilocytic astrocytomas uh, tend to do significantly better in terms of uh, survival um, compared to uh, the pure astrocytomas, and the oligodendral gliomas tend to do a little bit better than, uh, than astrocytomas. Um, the 10-year survival rate for uh, astrocytomas um, is still um, about 23%, uh, whereas that for oligodendrogliomas is in the range of 47%. And you can see the, uh, the age uh, differential in terms of the median age at diagnosis for the different subtypes of, of these gliomas. Next. So even though these are termed low-grade gliomas, um, a 10-year uh, survival of 20 to 40 percent is, is certainly not benign, particularly if you're looking at a 40-something-year-old person. Um, so uh, so there, even the natural history of this disease suggests that there um, is a risk of malignant transformation from a low-grade uh, glioma to a high-grade glioma, and the literature suggests that that risk is about 50 to 70 percent. Um, in uh, a period of seven to eight years. Uh, the median survival um, of all the uh, who, who grade two gliomas tends to be uh, approximately 10 years, irrespective of treatment. Next. So um, even without malignant transformation, though, uh, studies have shown that low-grade gliomas do show continuous constant growth. And on average, um, that growth is, is calculated at about two to four millimeters a year. So when you're following patients um, with serial MRI scans with low-grade gliomas, one thing um, to keep in mind is that if you take scans um, at short intervals, um, you may not see any observable growth uh, from one scan to another. For instance, if you look at a scan um, in six-month intervals, you may say that there's no growth and then uh, suggest to the patient that nothing needs to be done. But then looking over a longer interval uh, and, and the cumulative growth uh, is more apparent, uh, you can see that uh, the majority of these tumors do grow um, and some of uh, which could be significant over a longer period of time. Next. So this was a study that uh, kind of suggests that uh, these uh, tumors uh, do have a uh, change in the rate of growth at some point uh, in time, and that rate, that change in the rate of growth uh, does suggest that that tumor uh, may uh, transform to become uh, anaplastic in the near, near future. So one thing that you could potentially do if you're following these patients with serial MRI scans is to plot the rate of growth from you know, one point to the next, and if the slope is constant, um, it is uh, suggested from, from this study, at least, that uh, 
the, uh, the, the growth, the, the tumor is not necessarily transforming at that point in time. However, if you see an abrupt change in the, the rate of the growth of the tumor, that may suggest uh, that the tumor is uh, in the process of malignant transformation, and that could warrant uh, more aggressive treatment at, at that point. Next. Um, this was a study done uh, out of UCSF, uh, which suggests a uh, prognostic scoring system uh, for low-grade gliomas. And uh, these are the four factors that were uh, found to be uh, of prognostic significance uh, in uh, survival uh, of these patients, uh, irrespective of, of treatment. Um, although if you look at some of these factors, they do p come into play in terms of what type of treatment would be chosen. Um, so the four factors are location. Um, obviously, tumors in an eloquent location are more difficult to respect, um, and um, that could play into why uh, location uh, is a, a prognostic factor. Um, Carnosity performance status, age, and size um, of the tumor uh, is also uh, significant in terms of prognosis. Next. Um, so uh, th this is, um, you know, so, uh, Two, uh, two images of a, uh, a grade, uh, well, actually two images of non-enhancing tumors. Uh, and the point uh, that I wanted to make here is that um, even though a tumor looks like a low-grade uh, glioma on MRI scan, meaning uh, having no contrast enhancement, um, that is not necessarily the case. Um, on the uh, left-hand side, uh, that is a non-enhancing um, T2 uh, hyperintense tumor of a 40-year-old uh, physician. Um, can you forward? There's some uh, there's some subtitles under the scan that I think you need to um, uh, press the, the proceed button to see. Um, there. So uh, the point here is that even though that was a non-enhancing uh, tumor, uh, presumably a low-grade glioma, when we took it out, uh, it actually uh, was diagnosed to be a grade 3 anaplastic astrocytoma, whereas the tumor on the right, uh, also non-enhancing in a, uh, in, in a uh, person of similar age, um, turned out to be a grade 2 astrocytoma. Um, next. Um, so this was uh, a, uh, a study uh, of a series of, uh, of, of my, my, um, my personal series of, of non-enhancing uh, tumors uh, that were done um, over a period of about two years. And uh, we, we did a total of 42 tumors. And what we found was that um, 42 non-enhancing tumors, meaning there's no evidence of any contrast enhancement in these tumors, um, but at surgical resection, the final pathology diagnosis came back as a uh, low-grade, grade 2 uh, glioma in only 67% of these cases, and 33% of these actually turned out to be a higher grade. So the point made here is that imaging alone cannot necessarily distinguish between a low-grade tumor, which you may um, treat with just observation and serial MRI scans versus an anaplastic higher grade tumor which would warrant further radiation and or chemotherapy. Next. Um, imaging modalities that may be useful in, dis uh, in uh, better distinguishing this uh, include uh, things like MR spectroscopy. Um, this uh, I find is particularly useful in a diffuse uh, low-grade glioma whereby the tumor is not necessarily resectable, but you want to find a location whereby to get the most diagnostic biopsy. Um, in this particular case, this was a uh, diffuse low-grade glioma in the dominant left hemisphere, uh, periventricular in the white matter um, in, a, uh, in an older patient. Uh, clearly not a resectable tumor, um, but uh, in terms, and the patient had a previous biopsy uh, in the uh, more anterior area, which actually came back non-diagnostic. Um, as you can see from the MR spectroscopy scan, that more anterior area was actually relatively normal in terms of the choline to creatine ratio. If we targeted the um, the red voxel, which showed a, a you know, over threefold uh, increase in terms of the choline to creatine ratio. Uh, that was the area that we targeted for biopsy, and this tumor actually turned out to be a glioblastoma in that particular area. So, so the point here is that um, 
imaging uh, could be helpful in terms of determining uh, both the diagnosis and, and also surgical approach and biopsy location. Next. Um, ADC is another uh, imaging modality that's been used uh, to differentiate uh, between uh, normal brain um, and or tumor uh, and uh, not, uh, not quite as uh, distinct in determining um, low versus high grade uh, tumors but, or, or even subtypes, but at least if you're trying to differentiate uh, an area of stroke versus tumor, this may be useful. Next. Um, this was a study uh, from Pat Kelly uh, out of uh, NYU, which uh, showed the usefulness of uh, MR perfusion studies in uh, determining malignant transformation in low-grade tumors. Um, on the left-hand side, uh, that, that was a large uh, left frontal tumor that was followed over a period of three years, and you could see that um, the tumor, although uh, it grew a, a little bit in size, did not have increased uh, MR perfusion. Uh, whereas the tumor on the right uh, was uh, similar in size over time, but then had new areas of MR perfusion and then also new areas of contrast enhancement. Uh, the one on the left well, turned out to be to be a low-grade glioma that was not transformed, whereas the one on the right turned out to be a transformed anaplastic astrocytoma when subsequently operated on. Next. Um, and PET scanning is another modality that's used to differentiate uh, tumor uh, from, uh, from non-tumor uh, areas such as stroke. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that there are different tracers that are used for PET scanning. And uh, the, uh, the traditional FDG PET, uh, glucose PET, is usually not useful for um, low-grade tumors. It may be useful for the higher-grade tumors and for metastatic brain tumors, but not necessarily for low-grade gliomas. Um, at UCLA, we, we tend to use um, a, mod a modality called DOPA-PET, um, which seems to be more sensitive in terms of picking up low-grade tumors. Um, next. Um, and uh, other centers, uh, PET tracers such as uh, C11 methionine is also used for this purpose. Um, and again, uh, it's the thing to keep in mind here is that uh, when ordering a PET scan uh, to determine whether, for instance, a patient has an area of infarct or cortical dysplasia versus tumor, uh, what you, you need to keep in mind is that uh, FDG PET is usually not useful in this purpose and uh, a, a more sensitive PET tracer is, is necessary. Next. And so finally, I'm going to talk briefly about the molecular genetics of low-grade gliomas and what, uh, what we have learned from uh, recent studies in molecular uh, cytogenetics and, uh, and the, uh, the prognosis associated with certain cytogenetic markers. Um, pilocytic astrocytomas um, are, as you know, um, m much uh, um, more indolent than the typical diffuse who grade 2 astrocytomas, and they, they actually have very distinct uh, cytogenetic profiles the most common of which are uh, BRAF mutations and genes on chromosomes 5 and 7. Next. For diffuse astrocytomas, um, who grade 2, um, at diagnosis, uh, the majority of these tumors have P53 mutations. Um, a new mutation that was recently uh, discovered within the last year called IDH1, which is um, actually an enzyme in the Krebs cycle uh, and is found to be mutated uh, in, in about 70 percent of these low-grade tumors. Um, and a, a, a lot of these tumors also have PDGF uh, and, PD, and PDGFR um, over receptor overexpression. Um, this is usually what is seen at uh, initial diagnosis. And as the, uh, as the tumors progress uh, to a higher grade, um, meaning as they progress to a more uh, secondary type of malignant glioma or secondary glioblastoma, they accumulate additional mutations, such as loss of 10Q, um, RB mutations, and, uh, and there is a small percentage that accumulate P10 mutations. Those that do accumulate the P10 mutations, although it's only about 10%, uh, those low-grade gliomas that accumulate these mutations tend to have a better, uh, a poorer prognosis. Next. Oligodendral gliomas actually are quite different in the way they transform uh, to higher grades. 
uh, and uh, and they probably do uh, develop and uh, and uh, progress via different uh, cytogenetic and molecular pathways. At diagnosis, the uh, one of the most common findings is uh, 1P 19Q loss, um, which occurs in a large uh, proportion of these tumors. Um, IDH1 mutations are also found in a high proportion of oligodendrogliomas, and this is actually, again, as I said, a bit relatively new finding, and the significance of which uh, still remains to be um, uh, ascertained. Um, unlike uh, the pure astrocytomas, oligodendrogliomas tend to uh, have a high uh, incidence of MGMT methylation. And MGMT methylation actually seems to um, track or correlate with 1P19Q loss. So, um, you know, for, for the longest time there's been debate between whether 1P or 19Q loss is a prognostic indicator irrespective of treatment or a predictive indicator, meaning it predicts how well the patients respond to chemotherapy. It could be that the 1P19Q loss is actually a surrogate for MGMT methylation, and that's why these patients do respond well to, uh, to chemotherapy. Um, at progression, uh, oligodendrogliomas tend to pick up a 19P loss, CDNK mutation deletions, and P14R deletions. Next. So what does all this mean? Um, so, so you know, it, it's nice to do all the, uh, the, the lab work and the, the, uh, the characterizations of, of the molecular genetics of these tumors. But what, as clinicians, what we want to know is, you know, what does that mean for, for our patients? So to date, um, there haven't been that many validated prognostic or predictive markers. But the ones that seem to be um, correlated with uh, uh, prognostic uh, indicators um, and, and that has been you know, proven in, in several uh, papers and, and other studies um, one, include the 1P19Q uh, loss in oligodendrogliomas. Patients with 1P19Q loss do tend to have a longer survival. Again, as I mentioned, whether that suggests that they are more sensitive to chemotherapy versus whether they just tend to do better anyway, um, that's still somewhat debated. Um, the, the newer uh, mutation that has been found uh, just in the past year is what, uh, what IDH1 mutation, and that seems to be, in a recent paper, uh, correlated with a longer survival in low-grade astrocytomas. We do know that you know it is correlated with better survival in, in glioblastomas and higher-grade tumors, but the, uh, the implication of this mutation in lower-grade tumors is still not, um, not completely clear. Um, so these are prognostic markers that seem to correlate with better survival irrespective of treatment. Um, however, there is one predictive marker that seems to predict a better response to uh, alkylating uh, chemotherapy, and that's MGMT status. Uh, and that could be measured by either methylated uh, MGMT um, promoter status uh, via PCR or um, immunohistochemistry. Um, decreased expression of uh, MGMT. Um, or increased methylation, which means that the MGMT function is being blocked, uh, tends to uh, portend to a better uh, response to chemotherapy. Um, next. So, I, uh, so that, uh, that concludes what uh, I wanted to cover in terms of, uh, of the background of uh, this tumor type. Uh, and hopefully this will segue into the subsequent talks by Drs. Uh, Berger and Gilbert regarding surgery, radiation, and, and chemotherapy treatments.